Everybody. And do it while they tell mm -hmm. you're going, first of all. Okay, so if you think about your favorite memories, a special birthday or a wedding, a family gathering, some fun thing you did in your childhood, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, that kind of stuff, I pretty uh, wager pretty heavily that it ended up being around the table somewhere. Mm. It ended up around food, and um, so a lot of times our our our, our the things that are important to us do orient around table and gathering with other people like that. So really, eating is one of the surest ways to kind of cement relationships, invite fellowship. That's when, before we got phones, right? <laughs> but we can work on that, right? We can get back to that. Uh, but huge, uh, food, food is a huge ritual, signific a ritual significance to cultures around the world. And so it's no surprise then that when Jesus chose to do this most significant thing to give them this new teaching and to spend his last few hours, it's around a table, right? So he gathered with his disciples to share a meal and to uh, not share not only the elements of, of, of the Passover with them, but he shared his life. And he shared a key teaching with them in these moments that shifted the way that all of us, even to today, relate to God. So we're, of course, talking about what we call the Last Supper. And Mark's record of this event is found in chapter 14. And like we have seen in so many times when we've been together uh, of Jesus' life here at the end of his life, a ton of things are connected to the Old Testament. So we really can't get what's happening here without looking at that. So let's jump into our text for today. And we start in verse 12, and it's on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it's customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb. lamb. So this orients us again in time. Mark does that a lot to tell us where we are. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a command in the Old Testament that is in conjunction with Passover. So we look at Numbers 28, it tells us in the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. And the 15th day is the feast. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. And so <laughs> Passover is the meal on the first day and followed by seven days of eating nothing with yeast or leavening in it. This meant the purging of everything with yeast completely from their households. Now, yeast in the Bible points to bigger spiritual Ideas, right? So in the scriptures, yeast is a metaphor for sin. Now, if you try to rid your house completely of all the unleavened, uh, all the leavening in your house today, you would get the point of what's going on here. Now, if you're getting rid of absolutely every single thing that has yeast or leavening in it, it's a tall order. I mean, that means crackers, it means breading, it means crumbs in the pantry, it means cookies, it means Cheerios in your couch, it means uh, for, uh, everything. Uh, even down to, for us, today, that would mean your toothpaste because it has baking soda in it, and that's a leavening agent. So uh, when, you, when you start getting down to these minute particles in your, ha in your house, you see that that's a bigger job than you think it is. You can get rid of that loaf of bread that's on the counter there, but when you start looking at every single thing, then it's hard. It's a tall order. That's, just, that's the point. Same thing with sin. You might be able to identify the big things in your life. Oh, I've got an anger issue, or I'm, you know, somebody might say I have a lust issue or something like that. But what about, those are the big things. We can identify them right away. But what about the little things? What about materialism? What about pride? What about uh, the attitudes that we have against other people? When we start going through our lives and looking at those little things, it then becomes a little harder to find it. And that's the point there. So the celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread lasted eight days, beginning with the Passover meal and then stretching on. Now, the, the celebrations were so close in time that they, the names were sometimes used interchangeably. So you know, Passover was always the first day, but the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they referred that to Passover as well. And so, uh, now, <coughs> uh, so 
we get back to this thing in Mark here. It says, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him where he wanted to go and make preparations for the Passover. And so, they might, so the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the sacri sacrifice of the Passover lamb might be some detailed people in the room here. And that was kind of like that when I was doing this lesson. I was kind of working through this. It's like, wait a minute. How could Jesus eat the slaughtered Passover lamb here and still be the Passover lamb the next day? Isn't there some timing issue there? Isn't that off here? Because he had to fulfill every single prophecy and it wasn't just good enough to be close, right? It's really important for him to share this Passover uh, uh, meal with them to institute what's going to come up with the new covenant in a minute. But it's also critical for him to fill the prophecy of the, the foreshadowing of being slaughtered as the ultimate Passover lamb, exactly how it's commanded in the Old Testament. Now, I really read this interesting piece from John MacArthur. I don't know if you like him or not, but I thought this was really good. He said that this re is rectified by studying the ancient Jewish documents that revealed that the, the Jews in the northern part of Israel celebrated Passover on Thursday because they marked the Passover from sunrise to sunrise. That would be Thursday sunrise until Friday sunrise. The Jews in the southern part of Israel celebrated their Passover on Friday because they marked the Passover from sunset to sunset. So there would be overlap there. So that would, so Jesus eating the Passover here in this moment would have been Thursday after the dark like the Jews in the northern part of Israel did. But that allowed ample time for the events to unfold that are coming up here that we're going to get to in the next few weeks for him to be slaughtered at the exact time as prescribed by the law when the southern Jews were sacrificing their Passover lamb. Now, that overlap there, in the way they calculated Passover, both were following the law of Moses, but that allowed him to partake of the Passover here and be slaughtered at the same time, uh, in the precise time when that Passover lamb was being killed. And I love that, right? God does everything so perfectly, and we think it's a contradiction, but it's not. So, anyway, back to Mark. Uh, that's I know for some detail people like me. So <laughs> anyway, so back to Mark. It says, so he then gives them, tells them to go into the city, find a man carrying a water, a water jar, and follow him, and then go to the place where his the Passover will be made ready. And so has anyone been to a Passover Seder at somebody's house before? I don't know, anybody? Yes. Okay, so sometimes churches do Seders at, at, mm -hmm. like as a part of a teaching moment to kind of understand what was going on and how it foreshadows the cross. And while that's a really great instruction and teaching moment, Passover is not usually done in a congregational gathering. That's not the way it was. It was a traditional family feast. And it's not just the elements of that Seder plate like you might be familiar with if you've ever seen that. It's a whole event that lasts a couple of hours, and there's a whole sequence of how it unfolds. There's scripture, there's storytelling, there's a game for kids that's incorporated, there's singing, there's a full meal that happens, and so the whole family would have been involved. And so here, the disciples ask Jesus uh, where they're going to have their Passover together, and that's instead of them scattering to their individual homes. Now, this is a key celebration in the year here. So can you imagine if you are having a big thing for Easter coming up or for Christmas and everything and your husband or your brother or your son or whatever goes, yeah, no, I'm not coming. I'm going to go and hang out with the guys. <laughs> I mean, that's not going to go over real well, right? I mean, because this is a family event and some of these guys were probably heads of households. But uh, what it does tell us here is the extremely close relationship that Jesus has with his disciples after being together for three years. They were family. And they understood the importance of what was happening here. So after all of that, so they go, make ready, get together, and prepare for the Passover, like it says in these verses here. And after all that had gone on in 
Jordan Temple, if you remember from the last few lessons that we talked about, there's been a lot of uproar around Jesus in the temple, right? From coming in at the triumphal entry, the palm trees and the singing and all of that stuff. And then the teaching and all of the stuff that happened there. It's a lot of people there who are looking out to see Jesus again. Some love him, some not so much, right? So, so he has to be really careful here not to attract the huge crowds as he's coming in to celebrate Passover. So he is directing his disciples with precise knowledge of what to do, where to go, who to talk to. And so it reminds us here that Jesus is not the victim of any plot or any plan of the, the, the Jewish leaders or Judas or anybody else. Jesus is not panicked. Jesus is not upset. He is not even resigned to what's going on. He displays here, as he does throughout the gospel, a sovereign freedom and authority to follow the course of plan and, and course and plan that the Father has laid out for him. And I found this quote when I was studying this. He says, others may act against him, but they do not act upon him. And I love that, that, you know, he, there are things happening around him that looks like things are out of control, but that's not the case. He is in control every single step of the way. And so we go back to verse 18, and then we get into the meal. And uh, uh, Mark tells us, while they were reclining at the table eating. So a lot of us think about this scene of the Last Supper, and then we have this in mind, right? I mean, this beautiful painting and everything, but not really biblically accurate, right? Remember that Passover would be at sundown. You notice that it's light outside, and they would be at a table like we think about tables, but that's not the way it would, would be. So when we think about what is going on here, think more about it like this. It would be a low table, and they would lean on one arm with their feet away from the table. Now, Mark doesn't give us a lot of detail about the actual meal like you get in Exodus. It's supposed to be bitter herbs and lamb and all of that stuff. But what Mark does include here is that they were reclining. Now, we know Mark does not just give random pieces of information. He's very pared down on what, he's, what he is uh, including. So these details are important, and we can learn something from that. Now, if you've ever been to a real seder at somebody's house, you know that reclining at the table is part of telling the Passover story. So the, the meal celebrates Israel's uh, release from Egyptian bondage. And so the point is here that only free people have the luxury of reclining at the table. Slaves stand and serve, but free people relax and recline. And that is the point. It foreshadows the freedom that is about to be offered by Christ to the world through the cross. So, now three of the four Gospels have the events of the Last Supper. So there's a lot more going on at um, this, this moment than what Mark tells us. But Mark's account starts with a betrayal. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Now, this is, not again, not a surprise to Jesus. It's something that was prophesied all the way back in Psalm 41, verse 9. He who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And so the details of the betrayal of Jesus are recorded also in Matthew and Luke, and it's where we find out that the one who is going to betray him is, of course, Judas. And Judas has conspired ahead of this with the leaders and teachers of the law to get rid of Jesus, and Matthew tells us that he, that he agrees to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now, this is an embarrassingly low amount. Now, according to Exodus 21, it is the exact amount that is required to pay the owner of a slave that is killed by an ox. So this is a, uh, a, this is a slave's price. All the leaders of Israel thought that Jesus was worth, and so... When the disciples hear this, Jesus says this, they're all saddened, and one by one they say to him, surely not I. Now, a betrayal by someone who has eaten with you would be unthinkable in this culture. That would be a huge offense. And Jesus is revealing that this is about 
take place to his disciples. They're shocked by it. And they're like, they can't imagine one of these people who've been with them for so long would actually betray Jesus. And so they start to question themselves. Was it me? Did I do something? And one by one it says that they um, asked Jesus that. And this includes, we get down to Judas, right? And so imagine him in this moment looking at when Judas goes along with what everybody else says and goes, it's not me, is it? And then Judas, only hours ago, had bargained for Jesus' life and then betrays him and lies to his face. Matthew tells us that Judas was the one. He says, surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus says, yeah, it's you. Wow, what a moment, right? The tension in this room has to be so high. But I think this, this was actually the moment that Judas could have repented of his actions. He could have confessed in this moment and found forgiveness just like all of us do. Right? But he, the rest of the Gospels tells us that he had so turned away from Jesus that his thoughts and actions were so bent away from God that he allowed Satan the opportunity to influence him and enter him to carry out the worst betrayal in all of history. And even Jesus says so. End of this passage, it says, But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. So Luke and Matthew, we learn that Judas leaves before we get to uh, the, the, the actual instituting of the new covenant. It goes on in this passage. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. And so what he means here is that the bread is the sacrifice of Christ's body for the sin of the whole world. John 3, 16 and 17, you know those verses? He gave his life for ours. Romans 8, 2 to 4, you can look up those later. That's what he means here. So a couple things to point out here about, um, about the bread, specifically, and the wine that have kind of crept into the church over the centuries. First of all, if you grew up in a denomination or you've heard somebody say that when you take a communion or the Lord's Supper that it's a literal miracle of changing the bread into Jesus' actual body and his actual blood and it becomes his literal blood and body, that's not right, okay? Jesus spoke of literal things here, bread and wine, his physical body, his blood here, but the relationship between them it's figurative, right? Same thing, uh, that's, that's what's going on here. The verb is here means represent. So Jesus is no more a piece of bread than he is a literal door or a literal vine or a literal light, okay? This is, this is not what actually happens as some denominations teach. The other thing that, uh, that we have to be careful of is what you hear most here at communion a lot of times is this is my body, broken for you. You've heard that, right? Do this in remembrance of me. But if you look at what Jesus said, it's actually not a great translation because the order is wrong. And it implies something that didn't actually happen. Now, none of the Gospels have that phraseology in them. It's always in the same order, okay? Look, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it. The it that is broken is not his body, it's the bread, okay? So when this bread, uh, so it's all the same in every single one of them, right? Now, this phrase that's gotten into our language here in the church comes from the King James Version of 1 Corinthians 11, 24. Here's what it says. Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. However, the best manuscripts and the earliest manuscripts do not have this phrase in it. In, in fact, um, a lot of people think, scholars think that that was added later on. And in any modern translation that you get, even the word-for-word word ones like the, uh, uh, the ESV, the NIV, the NASB, the Christian Standard, the Holman, Holman Christian Version, all of them, this is gone. And it just says, this is my body, which is for you. So, now, uh, so Jesus' body is not broken on the cross. 
In fact, John states categorically otherwise. He said they did not break his legs so that scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones is broken. Now, if you define broken as being assaulted, his flesh torn, beaten, and bloody, then technically, yes, you can say maybe broken, but not in reality. Not in reality. If his bones were broken, then that would disqualify Jesus from being the perfect sacrifice. Okay? The Old Testament Passover lamb had to have its bones intact. It's all over the law. So the better way to say this is the way Mark and all the other Gospels writers have it. That is that he gave thanks, broke the bread, that is in literal tearing it into pieces, and then gave it to them. So again, the bread, said, represents Christ's sacrifice of his body, his life for ours. Moving on to the cup, he says he took the cup, gave thanks, offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant. Lots of translations have that word new in there, which is poured out for many, he said to them. And so to have a new covenant, you have to have what? An old covenant, right? And the old covenant, or what he's referring to, to here, and what the old covenant is, the law of Moses. And again, Exodus 24 tells us that when it was being brought down, that Moses took blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made. And that means literally cut, cut a covenant with you in accordance with all of these words. So the shedding of blood demonstrated as nothing else could the intensity of the commitment by cutting a covenant between the two parties were bound for life. Thus, the shedding of blood, the cutting of this covenant, established a binding nature of this transaction. And it's significant to know that both the old covenant and the new covenant are inaugurated with blood. And under that old covenant, the same inadequate sacrifices had to be done over and over and over again. So every time you had a sin, you had to have an offering for it. It was replicated again and again and again, day after day, month after month, year after year, century after century. The old covenant never provided full sacrifice for sin. It just pointed us toward what was to come. And so, but here on this night, the night in Mark chapter 14, everything changed. So there's a new covenant that he's establishing at this moment. And that new covenant is the one that was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah all the way back uh, to his time. And so what he says here, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Okay, so uh, in the old covenant, in Exodus 19, it starts with the, these words. It says, if you will, if you will, if you will obey my voice, it says. But the key words of the new covenant is not if you will. I will. This is God speaking here. So the covenant, this new covenant, originated and was sustained by God himself. So, himself. so we're going to make you a new covenant. And so there's two ways to make something new, right? Either by making a new version of an old design, right? You hear that new and improved with stuff we hear today on commercials all the time. It's most of the time it's not really new and improved. It's just maybe a little tweak here, a little tweak there. Not really new. So you can either do it that way, or you can create something that never existed before. And so the word here means not new in quality, not a reproduction of the old thing. And he makes this clear in verse 32. It's not going to be like the old covenant that I made with your forefathers when I took them by the hand out of Egypt. And so he's talking about the law here. This is this covenant I will make with the house of Israel, and I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And so the old covenant, written on tablets of stone, the new covenant uh, is on our hearts. The old covenant was to regulate behavior. The new covenant is going to transform us from the inside out. So change of behavior not comes by trying hard and following all these rules and regulations. Change and, and new behavior comes because you're changed at the deepest level on the inside of you. And so this new covenant 
It's not just gonna, gonna to, uh, to cover up sin. It's gonna get rid of sin forever. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. No, this new covenant, not about covering, about removing sin completely. Isn't that beautiful? I just love that. It's exactly what happened as a result of the cross. So the old covenant was full of shadows, and it was really great at revealing sin and showing where we fell short. And it gave us this forward-looking hope to a time when this covenant would be replaced with a new covenant that has the reality and has the ability to completely forgive the sins of those who believe in the Son and to transform their character from the inside out. And that's what Jesus is referring to back in verse 24. This is the blood, of, my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. And he, as he was saying here, he was saying this thing promised by God so long ago by Jeremiah, he says, it's here now. It is me. The new covenant is in my blood. Matthew gives us a clearer version. He says, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So succinctly, I found this great definition that I want to share with you uh, of what the new covenant is. First is God's promise that he will forgive sin, restore fellowship with those whose hearts turn to him and are transformed, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, Hebrews 8, 6, and that chapter of Hebrews is actually... He quotes Jeremiah there and explains how Jesus is the fulfillment of that new covenant. And his death on the cross is the foundation and the completion of the promise. Luke 22, 20. We become partakers of the new covenant by faith in Christ's perfect sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10. So it redefines what redemption looked like. And as we take part in the Lord's Supper and in communion, that is a reminder of us to us of what happened on the cross for us. And so you know what that means? It means that all the efforts of trying to do right things and live right and, and, and do things, they are no more effective to merit acceptance before God than all the bulls and sheep and goats and all of that that was sacrificed in the past. Not that the behavior doesn't matter. Of course it does. But it's not the basis by which you are accepted by God. Nothing we can do can earn that. So guess what? We can stop trying. We just accept what has been given to us through the cross. Mm. And if you have done that in the past, you know you're saved, then you know what? We can also accept that by the means, that that is the means by which we are enabled the way that God wants us to live as well. So his blood is the most powerful thing ever, ever in the history of the world, or ever will be to come. It is so powerful that it split time in half. It blew backwards to fulfill every single law handed down from the first covenant and renders it obsolete. That's what Hebrews 8 says. And then blew forward in time toward us to break the power of sin in your life, in my life, today. And if you are a Christian, sin has no hold on you. Inside of you now resides the Spirit of God, okay? Remember what Paul says in Ephesians? I pray that of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. Spirit-enabled strength is in you. Through Christ, we have access to God's power. And the word power there is the same word we get dynamite. It resides not out here somewhere, in your inner being. Paul is not asking that we be given that, but that we are aware of what already has been given to us and that we possess through Christ. And the purpose of this power is that so Christ may dwell in you. That is, move in, settle down, be in control, have influence, and change your heart through faith. That we would have experiential understanding of the love of Christ filled 
and be filled with the fullness of God. This is what is yours in the new covenant. His blood is the antidote that cleanses not only just sins, the actions that we do, but of sin itself that wars within your heart and holds you prisoner to all these desires and all the things that you don't want to be doing. You aren't held captive anymore. The power of the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. The chains are broken once and for all. No matter what you struggle with, no matter how big it seems or how persistent it is, it is gone once and for all. And it only has power over you that you give it. Okay? It is broken. This is the new covenant. And what we are called to remember and believe. It's simply received by faith. Accept that it's true, and then live out of what he offers. Don't live under the old covenant with all the rules and re regulations that you can't live up to anyway, but rest in the new covenant and walk in freedom. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that you didn't leave anything out and that you give us everything we need for life and godliness. And God, just help us to re realize what you did on that night when you uh, instituted the new covenant and then fulfilled every requirement only a few days later at the cross. God, help us understand, help us walk in the freedom that was so costly, so costly that, that you had to lay down your life for us. Let us walk. Let us live. Let us be examples. Let us be changed. In the power of your son, we believe, we receive, and we walk in the freedom that you give us. In Jesus' name.